Hey everyone, this is Mansions of Madness, Cycles of Eternity. I have noticed in my playthroughs of Mansions of Madness at home that you cannot play Mansions of Madness with just one player character or two player characters. The game claims that you can, but really it's a four player character game. So I'm going to be playing these four investigators. A quick note before continuing, this is a horror game, so there are some horror scenes described, and more importantly, there is a mention of suicide and hate crime. Very brief, but it is a thing. Also, insanity is a major theme of the game, so if any of that doesn't appeal to you, maybe skip this, this mini-series. And as part of the setup stage, I, before we go into the scenario, I'm going to review each character so we know what we have to work with. Carson Sinclair. Health is 8, and his sanity is 6. So high health, fairly low sanity, threshold, that's okay. His strength is 3, agility is 2, observation 5, lore 4, influence 4, and will 3. So his strengths, his, his, uh, his greatest attributes, really are his observation, his knowledge of lore, and his affable influence. Here's a little bit of background about Carson. Carson Sinclair has served three generations of the Webb family in Arkham, first as a footman and later as a butler. Always proper, Carson watched with disapproval as his most recent employer, Hercule Webb, began bringing bizarre artifacts and profane tomes into his house, engaging in occult studies. He was aided in these endeavors by his business manager, the disagreeable Dupuis. Disaster struck when Mr. Webb was drawn through an impossible hole in the sky while Carson brought his evening tea. No one believed Carson's description of the event, and with no proof of Mr. Webb's death, control of his estate, passed to Dupuis, who has quietly siphoned funds from the Webb Trust and effectively frozen out the Webb children. Carson has resolved to get to the bottom of the matter for the children's sake. It's always for the children, isn't it? His special ability is uh, another investigator within range may perform one action. Activate this ability only once per round. So that's kind of huge because this game really is, it's all about how many actions you have. That's the, the main timekeeping device, is, is what you get to do before the monsters do things. All right, next in line here is Rita. Rita Young. She was actually the first player character I ever played in Mansions of Madness. Luck of the draw. Her health is 9, so quite good. Her sanity is 5, so that's quite low. Her strength is 5, her agility is 4, so she's very good physically. Observation and lore are 3, influence is 2, which is like really low, and her willpower is 4. Rita has always been a, has always been good at running. Growing up in the south, she was well acquainted with discrimination and knowing when to make herself scarce. When she came up to Arkham to attend Miskatonic University on a track and field scholarship, she found things had not changed as much as she had hoped. The creepy people chasing after her were wore black robes, not white, but Rita ran all the same. When her roommate was attacked in the night while wearing Rita's jacket, Rita decided to do something about it. She started looking into the matter and found that the mysterious assailants were not part of the Ku Klux Klan, as she had assumed. Now Rita eagerly pursues any chance to investigate the unknown and hidden cults that flourish right under the noses of the authorities. She is done running. So that's Rita. Really great character. Like her a lot. Really powerful, physically anyway. But her special ability makes her even more powerful. Uh, I mean, it's a physical special ability. But uh, she can move a an extra space during a move action. Moving is an action, so you have to elect to take it. But when she moves, instead of moving the standard two spaces, she can take an, an extra space. And again, that's kind of huge because it's cramming more actions into the player character turn. 
and that's a big, big deal in this game, as I've stated. This here is Charlie Kane. He's a little bit of an outlier. He is not from the core set. He is from the, I think, Sanctum of Twilight set, or maybe the Threshold, Beyond the Threshold expansion set. Either way, he's, he's not from the core box, but, I mean, he's a good character. He's got a good ability, so I'm going to use him. Uh, he's got five str um, health, so that's re quite low, but he's got nine uh, sanity, so that's quite high. Although, as you'll see, health is really the, the key in this game, I think more than the, the sanity. But, I mean, because health, I mean, you just, when you run out of health, you're just, you're just dead. Charlie Kane, strength of three, agility of two, so not great physically. Uh, observation is four, lore is three, influence is five. He's literally a politician, so, I mean, he's got high influence. And will is four. So his strengths, again, observation, influence, and will. His story. Charlie Kane's campaign was founded by casting him as a man who took on the most important issues facing Arkham. Between his legion of political allies and his healthy amount of personal funds, he felt uniquely qualified to handle anything being an elected official brought his way. Monsters, cults, and strange rituals were the furthest thing from his mind, but in order to keep Arkham safe and his constituents alive and voting, he knows the most important issue is defeating the supernatural forces at work in his city. His special ability is, uh, while, in, wh while within range, that's three, three spaces, while within range of a person, so that's any, any person, not, not just another investigator, but any person in the game, within range of a person, he may convert a clue to a success, and he gets to activate that ability once per test. On the special um, Arkham, or uh, rather, Mansions of Madness dice, there's a blank side, a success side, and a clue side. The clue is this magnifying glass. So as long as he's within three spaces of another person, he, and he rolls a magnifying glass, he can convert one of those magnifying glasses to a success, which is huge. I think I forgot to read out Carson's special ability. No, I didn't. Someone gets an extra action with Carson. Rita can move farther than anyone else, and Charlie gets to convert a die from clue to star for nothing. And then last but certainly not least is Min Thi Fan. Uh, she's got seven, uh, seven health and seven sanity. Her attributes are very much middle of the road. Strength is 3, Agility is 4, Observation 4, Lore 3, Influence 4, Will 3. So, I mean, her strengths, I guess, are Agility, Observation, and Influence, but, I mean, they're just 4, so it's not, it's nothing amazing, but her ability is that once per round, you or another investigator within range may re-roll a die while resolving a test. So, if she, whether she rolls a, a blank or a clue, if, if I don't like the result of, of one of her die, I get to re-roll it. Uh, and that's just once per round. So again, not super powerful, but, but it's, it's very broad, which is nice. Min Thi Fan landed a good job directly out of school, perhaps due to her unique upbringing and her fluency in English, French, Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese. She worked for Mr. Thomas as his secretary for a number of years and considered him not just an employer, but a friend. But after coming across a strange book during the course of his work importing and exporting antiquities, Mr. Thomas became odd, moody, and ultimately took his own life. Suddenly, Mean was on her, way, uh, on her own for the first time in her life. Uncertain what to do, Mean set about putting Mr. Thomas's affairs in order and soon discovered that his important export, bi export business had exposed him to a dark and hidden world of the unknowable and unthinkable. Now Mean has a new task, one chosen for herself for the first time, discover what awful truth made Mr. Thomas commit suicide. Those are the players. It's a, it's a good batch of, of characters, I think. 
mechanically and and flavor flavorfully the second edition of mansions of madness is essentially controlled by an application this application runs on steam so i've just installed it on my my computer here and uh launched it and i'll just go to new game to get started so the first thing to do is to select the the scenario and there are as you can see quite a few scenarios uh, it says 22 i don't think i have access to all 22 because i don't have all the expansions but i have a lot of them um no i don't have a lot of them i have two of them and the core set so i get a lot of scenarios f for that and of course you could you can do your own scenarios as well which is what makes M M mansions of madness i think really really cool so switch over to that First thing is first, and that is to create a new game, or start a new game, rather. The, um, the introductory scenario, the, the, the two stars out of five difficulty scenario, is called Cycle of Eternity, which is what I'm going to play right now. After a rash of disappearances, your investigation brings you to the Vanderbilt Mansion during a meeting of a particular astronomical society. Can you unravel the mystery before the Cycle of Eternity turns once more okay um, there are other lots of other scenarios some harder than others so I'll probably uh, I, I intend to play cycle of eternity and then maybe continue on to rising tide just kind of going with the difficulty ratings but we'll see how long it takes to get through cycle of eternity as well I've played it before I've won it uh, I think probably once so let's give it a go all right, well, I know that we have Carson Sinclair, we have Charlie Kane, we have Mean Thiefan, and Rita Young. So start that game. And here's the starting, um, starting items. So we've got candles, a holy cross, holy water, machete. Okay. Okay, so we've got candles... Holy Water, Holy Cross, Machete, and Arcane Insight. That's a spell. So this is, um, these are <laughs> five items for four different player characters, which is a little bit awkward, but I think what we're going to do is try to play to people's presumed strengths, um, sometimes literally. And by that, I mean... Uh, I think Carson is going to be our spellcaster because he's not very physical, but he's high in lore. So that just, I don't know, that says spellcasting to me. Holy Water, the action of this is discard one horror and become focused. I think that might be a thing for Mean, maybe. Machete, I think it has to go to the strongest person, so that's going to go to Rita. A holy cross. Roll one additional die while resolving a, uh, a brain test, a willpower test. So everyone's kind of equal in that regard. I mean, threes and fours all, all around. But I think I'm going to go for... No, well, first of all, Carson doesn't have anything. I mean, he's got a spell, but no physical object. So I think I'll give him the cross. And then candles. Uh, you may discard this card to convert all clues to successes when casting a spell well obviously that has to go to carson because he's our spell caster so that's how that shakes out i think machete for rita holy water for mean candles and crosses and spells for carson and oh charlie didn't get anything hmm <laughs> well then maybe he'll get the cross or you know what he's gonna pick up he, he'll pick stuff up he's got his attitude he's got his charm he's got his personality so i think that's what i'm doing i don't know if that's smart but that's that's how i'm playing this oh of course two clue tokens so i'll give everyone two clue tokens clue tokens are currency that you turn in when you roll dice, or you may turn them in when you roll dice. If you get clue tokens on your die, 
and you want to convert one to a success, you pay a clue token, and then you convert that to a success. So they can be very, very, very valuable. You slump into your office chair after another long day of interviews. You have been investigating the disappearances surrounding a wealthy neighborhood for two weeks, but you have nothing to show for it. The telephone rings. You answer and hear the panicked voice of an older man. Is this the investigator who visited the Vanderbilt estate? You flip through the files on your desk. William Vanderbilt, a wealthy bachelor, mother rece recently deceased. He had refused to meet with you, but you were able to speak to several members of his serving staff. This is Eugene, Mr. Vanderbilt's butler. I did not know who else to call. The police think I'm crazy. Unnatural things have started happening here, and I am worried for my master. I think he is in danger. Please help. Finally, a lead. You hang up the phone, throw on your coat, and leave for the Vanderbilt estate. Your car rattles up the uneven drive, pulling to a stop in front of the estate. Several cars and carriages are parked along the drive. However, the butler who contacted you is nowhere to be seen. You knock on the large oak door to no response. Fearing something has happened, you try the handle, and the door swings open into a lavish entryway. Place the lobby tile and walls as indicated. Okay, so this is the first, the first segment of the board, and this is already, for what it's worth, already different from my other playthroughs. So this door up here uh, isn't actually there, so I'll grab uh, this little um, wall stopper and put it right over the door so that we remember that it's not actually a door. And I think that's everything. The, um, the text on the app sometimes gets in the way of the rest of the, the, the board, and you can't move it, <laughs> so it's kind of annoying. Um, so I don't know. As far as I can tell, that's everything. But there could be something uh, concealed behind this big block of text. There we go. And there, yes, there is. Okay. Uh, you step into the warmth of the house. A strange stillness hangs in the air, and your footsteps echo through the quiet entrance. Place your investigator figures as indicated. So we're all inside, uh, but there does look like there's supposed to be a a wall blocking one of the doors. Oh, I still can't see it though because of the the app text. So I'll just have to keep remembering to block off a door once I can navigate around. Ah, there it is. Up in the upper left corner, there's another painting. So there's another another painting up here. There's not a door, it's just a painting. A table with a telephone sits at the top of the staircase. On the right, place a search token as indicated. Alright, well, I see two search tokens, and I'm not really sure <laughs> which one is which. Uh, where, where's the stair? Oh, the stairs. I, I don't see stairs. Oh, I see stairs, okay. A mysterious painting of a nighttime landscape looms over the lobby staircases. Place a search token as indicated. Okay, so that's this one here. There's lots of paintings, but yeah. That big one is the one they're referring to. I don't think that probably matters. Oh dear. The silence is broken by the muffled shouts and sounds of a cra of crashing pots and pans coming from the door on your left. Place an explore token as indicated. You notice a shelf stacked with books and other objects nearby. Pushing the shelf in front of a door would act as a barricade. Now, I'll be honest... These barricades, they haven't really worked out all that well for me before. Um, but it's something to remember, something to keep in mind. So that's the setup, that's the board right now. And I figure let's just go through at least, usually the first Mythos stage is rather minimal. So um, I'm going to say let's just 
let's start this game and uh, and we'll see where it takes us. Okay, so uh, we know that Mean is here. She could go upstairs. Well, it's free to to investigate this token because there's no. This is all the same space. So maybe that's what she'll do first, is just sort of step up here and investigate this token. To investigate tokens, I go back to the app and click on the token that I'm investigating. A disheveled pile of papers sits on a table. Well, let's search them. So, so far we've used one action. We are using one action uh, for Mean, mean Thief Fan right now. The papers stacked on the table are invitations marked with today's dates. The stars have come round to their positions in the cycle of eternity. Oh, and we have a title. The Vanderbilt Astronomy Association cordially invites you to a celebratory evening. Gain one clue token, and then discard that search token. Okay, I've discarded that. So I'll give her another clue token, which, that's always good. Clue tokens are good. That's, that's... It's a free success to something. But now she's got another action to take. Well, I mean, we heard some noise coming from, from over here, so maybe maybe she should open that door. I mean, that seems kind of scary. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, we are here to, to investigate missing people. So, yeah, I think, I think we're going to open this door here it's, as her second action. A ruckus can be heard on the other side of this door, shouting the, cra the crash of pots and pans. And is that hissing? Uh, I hope not. The door swings open to reveal a dining room in chaos. An aging man in a tailcoat scrambles through a serving window into the kitchen as he tries to escape a strange black creature writhing on the dining room table. Discard this explorer token and place the dining room tile and a wall as indicated. All right, so. It looks like this door way up here doesn't actually exist, so we'll put a little bookshelf there. The creature turns to face you, its black serpentine body shifts and changes, playing tricks on your eyes as you try to focus on it. The creature unfurls its leathery wings and unleashes a blood-curdling screech, spawn a hunting horror as indicated, then suffer two horror, but a will check negates. Okay, so this is our first test, but also a monster. I need to grab the monster token. Okay, so the hunting horror goes here. That's good, good because it's, uh, let's move her closer to the door because she has opened the door. But she has not moved into this space. She's still pretty much within range of that hunting horror, but at least there's a little bit of a buffer there. It's always a good thing. However, oh no, it's not there. It's actually here. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, so it's right, right there. Just right on the other side of the door, essentially. That's kind of scary. Uh, and appropriately, she needs to do a horror check, essentially, uh, or a, it's, it's a willpower check, or she will s suffer to horror. Her willpower rating is three. There's never enough room on these things to roll dice. Okay, so two clues. Um, if, if I wanted to spend two clue tokens, she could she could convert both of those to successes and suffer zero horror. I find that spending clue tokens on things that don't damage you or or that could then damage something else is often kind of a waste. So what I might do instead is just have her re-roll because of her special power of re-rolling. I might just have her re-roll this to see if she can get a success and if not, just take the two horror. Uh, one success negates one horror, which means that she takes one horror. I I'm kind of okay with that. As as you'll see, horror, um, I mean, it, it does drive you insane, but 
um, it does also that's uh, you you can still play once you're insane. Um, whereas if you're if you take damage, then you can no longer play. Like if you if you if you exhaust all of your your health. Okay, so we've got uh, startled. You stagger backwards in alarm. Resolve immediately. No effect. Discard this card. <laughs> okay. That's the best possible result for a, a horror, I think. No effect, discard it. That's that's great. I will take that. Okay, good. We didn't even spend any clue tokens. Yeah, the, I, I'd say sort of for for uncovering um, a lurking monster from who knows where, that was a pretty good result. But this it, this isn't over, so I'll click continue, see what else happens. In the center of the dining table, a carving knife sits embedded in a roast. Place the knife common item as indicated. So that's in the same room as the hunting horror. Eh, a knife is just one additional damage if you use it, so I don't, I don't know if... I guess it's probably better than attacking something unarmed, un completely unarmed. But one one extra damage. That's not actually all that all that great, I guess. Um, it says that an investigator can pick up this item in the space as part of a trade action. So it is an action to t to pick it up. A china cabinet stands against the wall, though it looks to have been repurposed to store all manner of knickknacks. Place a search token, as indicated. You can see a kitchen through the serving window. Most of the cabinets are ajar due to the food prep, but one that has been locked shut with a chain catches your attention. Place a search token as indicated. In the kitchen, you can also see that someone has left the refrigerator open. Water leaks out into a puddle on the floor. Place a search token as indicated over here in the corner. And last but not least, you spot the old man you saw climbing through the serving window, huddling in the corner behind the oven. Sweat beads off his brow, and his eyes bulge in terror. Place a person token, as indicated. This is Eugene, the butler. You may move one space into the explored area. There's Eugene. Uh, moving one space into the explored area for mean with no actions remaining um, does not appeal to me. <laughs> I think she's going to very politely just kind of step to the side there, just in case someone else wants to rush in and take care of this beast from beyond the realm of reality. And I think that is exactly what we'll do. So, um... Like I say, we could technically barricade the door and hope that this thing doesn't just burst through. It looks rather sizable to me, so I don't think that's going to keep it for very long. And um, I think we just need our strongest player to move in, player character, to move in and start attacking this creature. And that's, that's what we're going to do. So she's going to rush in. That's one move. And then... For her second action, she's going to attack this creature. Now, the attack mechanic is handled through the app. I'll click on the monster drawer over here on the left, and then click on the monster. And here's the monster's little stat card. So it's got uh, seven health. I mean, it's not as much as it could be, I guess. Numbers get pretty high, but seven is pretty, that's a lot. So I'm just gonna attack. What type of weapon? Well, Rita has a machete. And a machete is a bladed weapon. So that's what we're going to use for the attack. You cry out in fury and slash at the creature, your eyes and blade gleaming. Agility, 
and I need two successes of agility. If you pass, well, well let, let's roll and find out what happens. I was certainly hoping that it wouldn't go off of agility and that it would go off of strength, but her agility is four, so that's not the worst thing in the world. It just happens to not be as good as I'd sort of hoped. Okay, so that's one, two successes. And something that I could convert to a success if I wanted to. Yeah, that's not a bad... No, all I need is two. Right? Let's read the text again. I mean, that is correct, but I just don't remember if... Some attacks benefit from more success. If you pass, your frenzied attack draws blood. The monster suffers damage equal to the weapon's damage plus your test result. If you fail, your unfocused strikes miss the mark. Okay, so yeah, the, the test result does matter. The bladed... the machete adds two to, to the damage. And she got two successes, so that's four damage. If I convert that clue token to a success, that's five damage, leaving it with only two health points remaining. And, um, as I said, I spend clue tokens f essentially in combat. So I'm going to spend a clue token and convert this die to a success, which gives me five damage against this creature. So we'll increment the damage. One, two, three, four, five. That's pretty much as good as one could hope. I mean, that's exactly what needs to happen for this. Now, because Carson Sinclair is right over here, uh, within range of Rita, he could grant her an extra action for this, for this round. And I'm thinking maybe that's what we should do, is just do the same thing over again. The alternative would be for Carson himself to attack with his spell, uh, which is, what is his spell? Arcane, oh, Arcane Insight. That's not going to do any damage, is it? That's a... You or another investigator within range gain one clue and then flip this card. Yeah, that's... So he's not going to be attacking with that. No one else has anything yet by way of weapons. So it would have to be an unarmed attack. And no one's as strong as Rita. So yeah, Rita may as well just take that extra action from Carson and do another attack with her bladed weapon. You stab at the creature, but your blade sticks and does not penetrate. You slam the pummel of the weapon with your other hand, hoping to drive the blade in. Strength two. If you pass, the blade lurches forward and the damage uh, is equal to your test result plus one. Okay, so we're essentially losing any bonus from that machete, really but we're rolling five die because it's based on her strength rather than her agility. So let's do that. Uh, there's two, two, two successes in there. Yeah, and that works. Equal to your test result, so that's two. Plus one doesn't even matter because we have just removed this monster from the board. creature lurches to the ground dead hearing the monster of uh, hearing the monster's final fate the old man in the kitchen cautiously steps out move eugene as indicated so he's going to move two spaces out into the main room here so there's eugene and she's already taken her extra extra turn mean has taken her turn so really it's carson and charlie remaining well charlie specializes in influence, as you might recall. So this could be the perfect thing for him to take care of. So I think I'm going to move him into the space with Eugene. I think you have to be in the same space to interact with people. I believe that's true. I mean, in a way, it doesn't make sense, right? I mean, in real life, you could just speak to someone through through an open door. 
but I believe to interact you need to uh, be in the same space. I'll have to look that up later. So he's going to move in once, and then for his action, for his other action, he's going to interact with this guy. And this is the guy who called us. So hopefully, <laughs> like he'll be able to explain a little bit of what's going on. So I'll click on his little icon here. The old man brushes himself off and tries to calm his shaken composure. You came just in time. Thank you so much for saving me. The name is Eugene. We spoke earlier today. I have heard noises from the attic, but the door is locked. I think something bad is going to happen. Are you okay? I could ask. Where is Mr. Vanderbilt? Or we could just ignore him. Well, we did click on him, so I don't think we're going to ignore him. Um, yeah, I think... I, I mean, he's... He's clearly okay. He's up and walking around. So let's just cut to the chase. Where's Mr. Vanderbilt? Those ruffians took Mr. Vanderbilt to the attic. You can get to the attic through the west door of the hall, but the door is locked. Mr. Vanderbilt likely keeps his key in... Uh, wait. I'm not sure if he would want me trusting you with this. Um, I love that one. It's just it's like, well, if you're not going to trust us with this information, then we'll just leave. We'll just go home. Like, do you want our help or not? It's the weirdest. That's the weirdest conversation. So influence is the test being asked for, and we are not really sure what we're aiming for. We just want as many successes as possible on five dice. Wow, that is not a great result. He has one clue. Um, he is within range of a person, so he can tur turn that into a success. I mean, he may as well. It's free. But wow, that is just... That that was shockingly bad for Charlie. Uh, I don't think that's going to give us the results that we want or need. Let's find out. <laughs> one result. Or one success. No, Mr. Vanderbilt would not like me talking would not like me talking about that with strangers. Okay. I mean, like, literally, we may as well just leave the house then. Like, if you don't want uh, our help, then w what are we doing here? You called us, dude. It's the weirdest, weirdest conversation. So that was Charlie's actions. That was all two of them, moving and then talking. I guess I could send Carson in. To try to charm this guy, butler to butler. But Carson's, um, oh, Carson has four influence, so he could do better, potentially. I guess I should have had Carson cast a spell. Arcane Insight. No, that wouldn't have helped. That just gains a clue. Okay, so Carson moves in, and we're going to try this again. The old man looks conflicted. He obviously wants to tell you how to access the attic, but he cannot bring himself to reveal Mr. Vanderbilt's secrets. Uh, I'm going to ask again, where is the key? Eugene is reluctant to tell you anything more. Attempt to coax with another influence check. Okay, I've got four influence for Carson, so let's just hope for the best. Okay, that's two, and then we've got two clue tokens. So I know I said normally I don't spend clue tokens on things that don't directly that aren't directly a threat. And I think I'm going to stick to that. <laughs> um yeah, I think I'm going to stick to that. I, so two successes. Now come on. I'll do three I'm going to I'm going to violate my better judgment and just convert one to a success. I think I'm going to regret this later, but the story kind of requires it, I think. One, two, three successes. All right, there we go. Mr. Vanderbilt was, has a hidden office that he, offer, he often re retreats to. The door is hidden in the estate's library, which is through the east door when you get into the hall. It uses a very strange lock hidden behind a bookshelf. The butler instructs you how to open the secret door in the library. Gain one clue. Ah, oh, see, that's that's great. So it didn't really cost me a clue. That makes me feel much better about violating my own rule. And I think I think that's everybody. I think everyone has now moved. 
uh, yeah, Rita, Charlie, Carson, and Mean have all taken all of their turns. I think it's the end of the player round, which must mean that it's the mythos phase. This is where things get bad. So I'll click on the end round button. End the investigator phase, confirm, mythos phase. For a moment, all you can hear is the pounding of your own heart. No immediate effect. Okay, that's a real, that's a real gift. Um, so nothing happens in the mythos phase this time around. I thought that was correct, but you never can tell with this game. It's always different every single time. So that's really good. That's a good first uh, round, I think. I got, I got information on uh, ostensibly where to find the key to the attic, and then we need to get up to the attic so that we can rescue Mr. Vanderbilt. Seems cut and dry, really. Let's just do that next time around. Thanks for watching.